Now, FSA uh, did come up with a draft regulation for genetically modified food. However, that allows for up till 1% GM threshold. Uh, anything up till that will be counted as non-GM. Whereas labs in India are able to test for GM presence until 0.01%. So the thresholds have been set 100 times weaker for GM presence. It doesn't look at what are the, uh, you know, is there even a need for those GM food? Are there alternatives available? It doesn't again perform the sort of tests which are missing in GAC as well. The sort of independent test, long-term test, comprehensive, you know, rigorous test. Uh, it again also does not speak about preventing conflict of interest in regulation. But point of mentioning all of that is that we need much stronger regulation to be able to tackle illegal GM foods. And also, uh, and with some of this as well, given there are no, you know, these uh, do not have a, any immediate uh, necessarily health impact. Who is to even test on, given, you know, the labeling is not done, who is to even test on what impact they would be having on humans, given obviously what we have seen on what is happening for cows and rats, if people are consuming those. Uh, there is, uh, again, uh, as with, you know, all those years uh, earlier in the case of BT Brinjal, there is strong U.S. pressure to weaken uh, our the GM regulation even further. And that is to allow for uh, GM foods in uh, U.S. to be exported to India. Now, again, uh, if we look at uh, how other countries in the world are doing, you know, often also it is also mentioned that we, you know, we do not want to be a backward country. We do not want to remain behind. But if we look at it, over 170 countries in the world do not grow GM crops. It's literally five to 12 countries which are allowing for uh, GM crops to be grown. Uh, there are countries like Germany, Sweden, which used to have some GM crops being grown, but do not allow for that now as well. You know, most of the developed countries in the world, they do not allow for GM crops as well. And just wanted to highlight uh, beyond, you know, now that we've looked at a bit of the history uh, of GM and how that has come in and some of the impacts of it, I also wanted to touch on the future aspects of GM uh, in Indian agriculture as well. There are new age GMOs, you know, known as gene editing, uh, which are also being allowed in India at an even weaker regulation than they were there for GM crops. Now, obviously, we have to fix the GM regulation. There is uh, already an even weaker regulation than that being allowed in India. Now, in um, modification, genetic modification, what they are mentioning is that that modification allows for a, a trans gene, a foreign gene to be inserted in a GM crop. Here, they are speaking about just editing an existing gene. Uh, and which is why they are saying, but however, what has been found time and time again in a whole lot of research coming in from other countries who have been looking at this earlier, uh, is that it is not a precise tool. They are saying that this is a precise tool. It will not have any issues. There are a whole lot of unintentional impacts. The science of genetics does not work on that. You can edit one gene and nothing will happen to the genes nearby. Uh, the omnigenics as the science is now being started to uh, understood is that what you do uh, here will have downstream impacts, will have impacts somewhere upstream, which you will not be able to figure out unless you test for it. And uh, the regulators have taken a position that two of the three in gene editing categories, they would not be called GM at all. They would be allowed to come into our food systems without people even knowing that uh, what they might be consuming might be GM. Now, there are a whole lot of other crops uh, in uh, India beyond mustard on GM crops, uh, which are there in the research pipeline as well. You know, I mean, you name it, there are fruits, there are vegetables, there are grains. Uh, uh, everything is up for genetic modification. Uh, what we also know is that we are actually having, you know, obviously, in addition to the food, we are also having seeds being imported in um, uh, India from countries which grow GM varieties of these crops. It is quite possible that some of the illegal GM cultivation being seen in India is from such smuggled GM crops. There is one group which openly actually speaks about growing such uh, illegal crops and also, uh, you know, mention about smuggling uh, some of these crops as well. Again, they have been able to escape any attention from the investigation authorities in terms of actual action being taken. Now, again, I've already touched on upon a whole lot of this, but just worth reflecting as well. If you look at the sort of opposition which has come from various stakeholders, you know, state governments, medical groups, 
oil seed industries, a section of scientists, beekeepers, the farmer groups themselves, environmentalists. Obviously, I mean, if you look uh, at everything but the bottom, you know, uh, the mandis themselves, consumer groups, organic natural farming or, or food groups, all of them have opposed GM crops. Now, who's to actually gain from this? You know, that is the poor paksh we also have to uh, apply. Uh, and w when one does that, one sees that it is actually the seed and the agrochemical industry who are to gain from this. You buy the uh, GM seeds and you also have to buy the agrochemicals, the fertilizers and the pesticides, which go hand in hand with the increased need for those. We have already seen, we are seeing a whole lot of uh, greater corporate control on seeds. And uh, what we have seen in the case of cotton has led to further consolidation of corporate control as GM cotton came into being. They are the ones who are to truly to benefit out of this. And this is the pressure and the lobby groups which are being able to push a whole lot of these. And obviously countries like US who have to gain from being able to export their uh, GM food crops to India. Now, uh, people always ask, uh, I, I mean, you know, okay, fine. You mentioned a whole lot of these issues. I, I mean, but what is the solution? We actually have the solution in our hand as well. We have organic and natural farming techniques and methods. And obviously, uh, what also has to be seen is that both cannot go hand in hand. We have a situation where the government is pushing organic and natural farming like never before. We also uh, have a situation where another ministry within the government has also been allowing GM crops in a situation, in a certain manner like never before as well. As we speak right now, we have world's largest natural organic farming program taking place successfully in India, showing great results, showing you know comparable yields or even higher yields at lower cost, uh, better nutrition, being able to resist a tackle situations such as cyclone, uh, you know, large scale adoption by farmers, gradual transition, uh, gradual, uh, unlike the one which was seen in Sri Lanka, the civil society and government working together collaboratively to promote organic and natural farming, uh, being adopted, being adopted slowly and gradually by farmers. So obviously, you know, showing reduced water usage, uh, showing a whole lot of uh, savings on fertilizers in those areas, showing uh, a reduction in electricity uh, costs as well. What also has to be kept in mind is that organic natural farming cannot go hand in hand with GM. Uh, you know, one of the basic definitions, one of the basic principles of these is that G, uh, GM seeds should cannot be allowed. And what will also happen is that uh, you have an organic natural farm, you have a GM uh, farm next to it, it will inevitably contaminate or the herbicide drift, as we spoke about earlier, will, you know, uh, impact the organic natural farm as well.